Iron is an important mineral that can be found in plants, animals, soil, air, water, meteorites, and rocks, including the ones found on the surface of the moon. It is a metallic chemical element which has been utilized by humans for centuries. Iron is part of the hemoglobin molecule that carries oxygen in the blood and distributes it to different cells in the body. Iron is necessary for many of our metabolic functions. Iron aids our bodies in detoxifying poisons and converting sugar into energy because of iron's presence in our enzymes. Anemia, a common problem that exists during pregnancy, is a result of iron deficiency. Iron deficiency can re result in severe fatigue, low functioning immune systems, shortness of breath, and confusion. Iron is supplemented in our diets through foods like cereal and flour. Although many problems can result due to a lack of iron in our diets, problems can also arise when too much iron is present. In the middle of the 14th century, Europe was swept by the effect of the bubonic plague. One third to one half of the population of Europe was killed because of this horrific disease. It is believed that this disease originated in a fleet of Gionese trading ships that were docked in Italy in 1347. As members of the crew started to die because of contact with the disease, the looters who came to rob the sinking ships also made contact with the plague. The plague was eventually blamed on different nationalities. First, the Jewish people were blamed because they seemed to escape the effects of this disease. However, many scientists now believe that this may have been a result of their annual Passover ritual of removing grain from their homes, thereby removing exposure to rats that carried the plague. However, the real mystery that surrounded the plague was how some people were seemed to be affected by it while some people survived the, the, the attack. New research indicates that the amount of iron in a given population can indicate how the population, how vulnerable the populations were to the plague. Dealing specifically with hemochromatosis, the topic of this chapter, research has indicated that it predates the plague and originated with the Vikings as they colonized the European coastline. When the plague began, people who had chemochromatosis were especially resistant to this infection. If having this mutation aided the survival of certain people throughout the various outbreaks of the bubonic plague, then it may be that carriers of this gene survived and reproduced, thus bringing, bringing this mutation into the population much more frequently. Hemochromatosis disrupts the way that the body metabolizes iron. Iron is a trace element for the human body, meaning that it is needed only in small doses. A person that is affected by hemochromatosis continues to absorb iron unincubated because the body thinks that it doesn't have enough iron. Thus, a buildup of excess iron occurs in the body. Eventually, this excess iron is deposited into different parts of the human body, which leads to, leads to damage of the joints, vital organs, and bo overall body chemistry. Some of the symptoms of hemochromatosis are liver failure, heart failure, arthritis, infertility, and even cancer. As iron is distributed throughout the body, one type of cell seems to receive even less iron than it usually has, the macrophages. Macrophages are a type of white blood cell that circulate our immune system, looking for any pro problems or concerns for the body. Iron, deficiency mic iron deficient micro macrophages are seen to be much better at combating bacteria because of the limited availability of iron. Hemochromatosis is caused by a genetic mutation. Thus, it is inherited, and the gene for it is very common in the populations of Western Europe and those whose ancestors are from the areas around Western Europe. The mutation remains in our gene pool because the mutation increases our biotic potential in many cases, meaning that it will increase the chance that we will reproduce and thus is beneficial to us as a species. From the effects of the bubonic plague came out two methods for the treatment of iron-related diseases. The first was iron dosing. Iron dosing is the act of putting more iron into a person's body through methods such as injections or iron enha enhanced formulas. Iron dosing is primarily used to treat those suffering from an iron deficiency, such as anemia. On the other hand, bloodletting is a treatment used to s on people suffering from hemochromatosis or an excess of iron in their bodies. Regular bleeding can reduce the amount of iron in the body so that the iron buildup is not so damaging to the body's vital organs. Other diseases can also be treated using bloodletting. Although the practice is ancient, bl 
Bloodletting can be useful. It was often dismissed as being too primitive and called insane, but it has made a comeback as one of the most effective treatments of a, a very important and damaging disease, hemochromatosis. Apoptosis is the term used to describe the normal death of the cell in living organisms. It occurs when a cell detects that it has become damaged or infected and it convinces the dangerous cell to kill itself. In other words, apoptosis is like an aging mechanism. Progeria and other accelerated aging diseases suggest that aging is pre-programmed. Although this disease is rare, scientists have discovered that it holds clues about the normal aging process. A telomere is a region of repetitive DNA at the end of a chromosome which protects it from deterioration. Cancer cells manipulate telomerase, an enzyme that lengthens the telomeres. In typical cells, telomerase is inactive, so telomeres are shortened. But cancer cells can overwork telomerase so that telomeres are replenished more rapidly. This means that the cell can reproduce forever. More than 90% of the cells in cancerous human tumors utilize telomerase. The Hayflick limit, a discovery that individual human cells divide 50 to 60 times before apoptosis, is a potent check against cancer, and it is also affected by cancer cells. Cancer protection and the Hayflick limit aren't the only evolutionary explanations for the aging mechanism. In order to delve further into figuring out why we are who we are and why we work the way we do, we must look at reproduction. More importantly, why has evolution led humans to give birth the way we do? Childbirth in humans is riskier, longer, and seems more painful than it is in any of our genetic cousins. Scientists believe that it has to do with big brains, bipedalism, and backward-facing babies. There are two different theories about how humans shifted from all fours to two feet, the conventional savanna hypothesis and the more interesting aquatic ape hypothesis. Which theory seems more likely? The savanna theory holds that our ape-like ancestors abandoned the dark African forests and moved into the great grassy plains because of climate changes that led to massive environmental change. Some combination of these new circumstances, the need to scan the horizon for food or predators, or to cover long distances between food and water, led the savanna hominid to begin walking upright. The savanna was hot and all the brave males chasing animals tended to overheat, so they lost their hair to keep them cool. That's the conventional theory, anyway. Elaine Morgan, a Welsh writer, was skeptical about the savanna hypothesis. She couldn't understand why evolution, so concerned with reproduction, would be driven only by the requirements of the male. If humans started walking on two legs to travel faster, why can cheetahs and even slower quadrupeds outrun us? We lost our hair because the males got too hot chasing antelope, so why do females have even less hair than males? In 1960, marine biologist Alistair Hardy offered a theory suggesting that apes became isolated on an island and had to adapt to the water, which would explain why humans are the only land mammals with fat attached to our skin. The aquatic ape hypothesis builds a compelling case. It would explain many things, like how the ability to survive on land and in water has tremendous benefits against predators, how walking upright helps venturing into deeper water, how we may have lost our fur to be more streamlined in water, why we have downward-facing nostrils to aid in diving, and how extra fat in babies helps keep them afloat. Legend says that the first medical water birth took place in the early 19th century in France. Birth attendants were struggling to help a woman who had been in labor for more than two days when a midwife suggested a warm bath might help the mother relax. According to this story, the baby was born shortly after its mother settled in the tub. Proven advantages of water birth include no increase of infection in either mothers or newborns. There was an additional protection for newborn against aspiration pneumonia. Babies don't gasp for air until they feel it on their face. When they are underwater, the mammalian diving reflex triggers them to hold their breath. Mothers delivering in water also have a significantly shorter first stage of labor. And most remarkably, women giving birth in water need no painkillers. Primitive swimming would be a surprising instinct for an animal that evolved into its more or less current form on that hot, dry plains of the African savanna. This behavior of human newborns in water offers another suggestion that the aquatic ape theory holds true. Throughout this video, we summarize two of the most important chapters written by Dr. Sharon. As this novel is made up of a number of various topics, we came up with three main points to make the reason for this book evident. Number one, life is in a constant state of creation. Number two, nothing in our world exists in isolation. Number three, our relationship with diseases is complex.